All right, you guys, it's elevated here. Uh, continuing our series on cope, the denial of death, or why everything is a cult. Um, so today we are starting part one of part two <laughs> of the copes. This is going to be the longest section, um, so I'm probably going to be splitting it up. It looks like I might be splitting it up into more than two parts, but hopefully I can... Um, release all those together so we'll see um but yeah part two the copes um just to kind of recap what we looked over at part one um so when we talk about the quote-unquote fear of death we're actually talking about um a number of related things that aren't necessarily the fear of death itself but like they all kind of they're all kind of talking about the same thing um, so first off, we looked at man's duality, which is the um, the dichotomy of having a rich, like, inner symbolic self, which fundamentally, fundamentally feels um, significant, special, unique, all that good stuff, um, versus the external material, dense, icky, corporeal body self. Um, and um, just being, um, what's it called? Weighed down by both of those, um, both of those burdens. So um, a good book to look at all this is um, Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being. So he talks about um, so it's, it, first off, it's, like, easier to look at, um, like, the corporeal existence as being a heavy, immense burden, a hefty burden, um, but this book also looks at the, the flip side of that, uh, the, um, the free symbolic self being so airy and um untethered that it's almost unbearable um just the sheer amount of like potential and freedom the symbolic self has um but that book kind of focuses on um looking at all that through the lens of like love and relationships um but yeah um it is a good book because it focuses on um philosophy um, like I said last time, you have the three, um, the three schools of thought, philosophy, psychology, and spirituality, and you kind of want to merge those three together. So, um, this first book I would recommend is the philosophy, um, part, but yeah. So that's the first, uh, dichotomy of the fear of death. Um, the second one is staring into the face of death and life. Um, so not only do you have this tension, this dual existence, um, eventually one day you are destined to die. So that is um, the fear of death itself. But you also have the fear of life as well, which is the external world being so overwhelmingly um I use the phrase tremendum fascinosum of each and every single thing in the external world is also um a source of terror because of how like overwhelmingly overwhelmingly powerful it can be um so for the second part looking at the spirituality of it and um, looking at like what kind of God would put you um, in a place like this, I would recommend watching SQS. Um, I kind of I mentioned him in my bonus video, but I'm gonna have to introduce him because um, it really is a good ta uh, tag along with all of this series going on. So first one is Bill Kandera, the second one is SQS, and then um, let's see, we looked at heroism, the initial cope. Um, which is the idea that um, you you can achieve this sense of like significance um, and achieve immortality, whether that's um, physically or symbolically. 
Um, so that's that's the first um, the initial cope, and that's the that's what all of these other copes are striving towards is just validating that sense of heroism. But yeah, and then we also looked at depression and the failures of heroism, and that kind of that's kind of like an introduction to part three, where we're actually going to look at all the modern problems and how all of these. Um, attempts at heroism end up failing. But yeah, today we're doing part two, the copes, and um, to tie off um, the third leg, um, I would recommend for the psychology aspect of this, I would recommend reading Robert Wright's Why Buddhism is True. So between those three, um, Milan Kundera's The Unbearable Lightness of Being and Philosophy, SQS's um, um, discussion of our predicament in a uh, hellishly slash heavenly world um, and spirituality and Robert Wright's Why Buddhism is True and Psychology. Those three, if you look at those three and then also watch this series, that'll actually help you immensely. But yeah, um, so yeah, part two, the copes, um, as far as me recording right now, I'm just going to be doing transference code part one and two, so let's go ahead and get started, oh yeah, um, I did want to recap, um, that first part with some of, um, I have my writing and then a quick poem from Jack Kerouac, just looking at, um, the fear of death and the tremendous tremendous predicaments that we're in so yeah so overwhelmingly awestruck at the utter beauty and grandeur of life and reality and the universe shook to the very core brought to my knees tears shed and yet so terrifically morose Despair and sorrow and pain and fear and hate and disgust is equally overwhelming in its frightening grandeur. In life, the bad is inevitable, an inexplicable and exorbitant tax upon the overall expense of simply being alive, while the good is mercifully bestowed by the grace of a maddeningly enigmable God. And this is Jack Kerouac's 211th Chorus. The wheel of the quivering meat conception turns in the void, expelling human beings, pigs, turtles, frogs, insects, nits, mice, lice, lizards, rats, roan racing horses, poxy bucolic pig ticks, horrible unnameable, unnameable lice of vultures, murderous attacking dog armies of Africa, rhinos roaming in the jungle, Vast boars and huge gigantic bull elephants, rams, eagles, condors, pones and porcupines and pills. All the endless con conception of living beings gnashing everywhere in consciousness throughout the ten directions of space, occupying all the quarters in and out, from super microscopic no bug to huge galaxy light year bowel illuminating the sky of one mind. Poor, I wish I was free of that slaving meat wheel and safe in heaven dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. Last time I was, like, very somber with it and just being like, um, oh, this is such a, such a serious topic, blah, blah, blah. It's, I don't know, man. It's just funny to me now. But <laughs> let's go ahead. Transparent scope. Um... So yeah, like I said, this one I'm gonna probably just gonna be reading off more off, um, more so, than actually commenting on it. But um, like I said, part three is where gonna be where I'm gonna be doing the most dialogue. Anyways, here we go. If the universe is fundamentally and globally terrifying to the natural perception of the young human animal, how can he dare to emerge into it without with confidence? only by relieving it of its terror. This is how we can understand the essence of transference, as a taming of terror. Realistically, the universe contains overwhelming power. Beyond ourselves, we sense chaos. We can't really do much about this unbelievable power, except for one thing, 
we can endow certain persons with it. The child takes natural awe and terror and focuses them on individual beings, which allows him to find the power and the horror all in one place instead of diffused throughout a chaotic universe. The transference object, being endowed with the transcendent powers of the universe, now has in himself the power to control, order, and combat them. In Rank's words, the transference object comes to represent for the individual the great biological forces of nature to which the ego binds itself emotionally and which then form the essence of the human and his fate. By this means, the child can control his fate. As ultimately power means power over life and death, the child can now safely emerge in relation to the transference object. The object becomes his locus of safe operation. All he has to do is conform to it in the ways that he learns, conciliate it if it becomes terrible, use it serenely for automatic daily activities. For this reason, Angiol could well say that transference is not an emotional mistake, but the experience of the other as one's whole world, just as the home actually is for the child, his whole world. Um... Yeah, so we're introducing the transference object, which um, becomes like this locus of of power. So instead of like being overwhelmed by looking at all of life as being overwhelmingly terrifying, you you focus that almost into one one whether it's like one person or one ideal or something like that. Um, so now. Um, to appease that person means to appease the 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 terror of the universe. <laughs> yeah. Um, this totality of the transference object also helps explain its ambivalence. In some complex ways, the child has to fight against the power of the parents in their awesome miraculousness. They are just as overwhelming as the background of nature from which they emerge. The child learns to naturalize them by techniques of accommodation and manipulation. At the same time, however, he has to focus on them the whole problem of terror and power, making them the center of it in order to cut down and naturalize the world around them. Now we see why the transference object poses so many problems. The child does partly control his larger fate by it, but it becomes his new fate. He binds himself to one person to automatically control terror, to mediate wonder, and to defeat death by that person's strength. But then he experiences transference terror, the terror of losing the object, of displeasing it, of not being able to live without it. The terror of his own finitude and impotence still haunts him, but now in the precise form of the transference object. How implacably ironic is human life? The transference object always looms larger than life-size because it represents all of life and hence all of one's fate. The transference object becomes the focus of the problem of one's freedom because one is compulsively dependent on it. It sums up all other natural dependencies and emotions. This quality is true of either positive or negative transference objects. In the negative transference, the object becomes a focalization of terror but now experienced as evil and constraints. Um, we're going to talk about that later, but uh, the negative transference, uh, when you negatively transfer, a lot of people did that, for example, um, in the 2016 elections. <laughs> um, most people voted, uh, I would say, for the... I would say more than any other election in U.S. history, more people voted against a person than for a person in the in the last couple of elections. Um, because that negative transference is, we're going to look at it later, but it is also a very, it is just as powerful as the positive transference. Um, but yeah. It is the source, too, of much of the bitter memories of childhood and of our accusations of our parents. We try to make them the sole repositories of our own unhappiness in a fundamentally demonic world. We seem to be pretending that the world does not contain terror and evil, but only our parents. In the negative transference, too, then, we see an attempt to control our fate in an automatic way. Yeah.
positive use of the transference object explains the urge to deification of the other, the constant placing of certain select persons on pedestals, the reading into them of extra powers. The more they have, the more rubs off on us. We participate in their immortality, and so we create immortals. As Harrington put it graphically, I am making a deeper impression on the cosmos because I know this famous person. When the ark sails, I will be on it. Man is always hungry, as Rank so well put it, for material for his own immortalization. Groups need it too, which explains a constant hunger for heroes. Every group, however small or great, has, as such, an individual impulse for eternalization, which manifests itself in the creation of and care for national, religious, and artistic heroes. The individual paves the way for this collective eternity impulse. Um, I think we mentioned it in part one, too, this eternity impulse, this impulse for eternalization, um, this striving for more life is just the opposite side of the coin of the fear of death. Um, and like, like we looked at it earlier, um, the transference, um, doesn't actually get rid of the fear of death, um, because it, it, it just transfers it onto the object instead of, um, Well, we'll see. This aspect of group psychology explains something that otherwise staggers our imagination. Have we been astonished by fantastic displays of grief on the part of whole peoples when one of their leaders dies? The uncontrolled emotional outpouring, the dazed masses standing huddled in the city squares, sometimes for days on end, grown people groveling hysterically and tearing at themselves, being trampled in the surge toward the coffin or funeral pyre. How to make sense out of such a massive neurotic vaudeville of despair. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what a funny phrase. Um, <laughs> in one way only, it shows a profound state of shock at losing one's bulwark against death. The people apprehend at some dumb level of their personality. Our locus of power to control life and, de as life and death can himself die. Therefore, our own immortality is in doubt. All the tears and all the tearing is, after all, for oneself, not for the passing of a great soul, but for one's own imminent passing. Immediately, men begin to rename city streets, squares, airports, with the name of the dead man. It is as though to declare that he will be immortalized physically in the society, in spite of his own physical death. So, yeah. Let me go ahead and go back and read that again. Our locus of power to control life and death can himself die. Therefore, our own immortality is in doubt. All the tears and all the tearing is, after all, for oneself, not for the passing of a great soul, but for one's own imminent passing. That fear of death is, well, unless you deal with it head on, it's ever present. <laughs> I just think it's funny. Um, one can't help musing about how one of the most advanced scientific societies of the 20th century resorted to improvements on ancient Egyptian mummification techniques to embalm the leader of their revolution. Excuse me. It seems as though the Russians could not let go of Lenin even in death, and so have entombed him as a permanent immortality symbol. Here is a supposedly secular society that holds pr pilgrimages to a tomb and that buries heroic figures in the sacred wall of the Kremlin, a hallowed place. No matter how many churches are closed or how humanistic a leader or a movement may claim to be, there will never be anything wholly secular about human fear. Man's terror is always holy terror, which is a strikingly apt popular phrase. Terror always refers to the ultimates of life and death. Yeah. Um, oops, I went back. Early theorists of group psychology had tried to explain why men were so sheep-like when they functioned in groups. They developed ideas like mental contagion and herd instinct, which became very popular. 
But as Freud was quick to see, these ideas never really did explain what men did with their judgment and common sense when they got caught up in groups. Freud saw, well, Freud saw right away what they did with it. They simply became dependent children, again, blindly following the inner voice of their parents, which now came to them under the hypnotic spell of the leader. They abandoned their egos to his, identified with his power, tried to function with him as an ideal. As the highest ambition of the child is to obey the all-powerful parents, to believe in him, and to imitate him, what is more natural than an instant imaginary return to childhood via the hypnotic trance? There is no such thing as a hypnotizing, a giving of ideas in the sense of physical incorporating some of, of some, of, well, in the sense of physical incorporating of something quite foreign from without, but only procedures that are able to set going unconscious pre-existing auto-suggestive mechanisms. It is not so much that man is a herd animal, said Freud, but that he is a horde animal led by a chief. It is this alone that could explain the uncanny and coercive characteristics of group formations. The chief is a dangerous personality toward whom only a passive masochistic attitude is possible, to whom one's will has to be surrendered, while to be alone with him, to look him in the face, appears a hazardous enterprise. This alone, says Freud, explains the paralysis that exists in the link between a person with inferior power to one of superior power. Man has an extreme passion for authority and wishes to be governed by unrestricted force. It is this trait that the leader hypnotically embodies in his own masterful person. Or as Fenichel later put it, people have a longing for being hypnotized precisely because they want to get back to the magical protection the participation in omnipotence, the oceanic feeling that they enjoyed when they were loved and protected by their parents. Um, and we're going to talk about this later too, but um, I mentioned this earlier in part one, the, the agape merger, this idea of like all his love and like this merging back into like, what did I say? Like fetal position, oceanic, like, um, um, what do they call that when you're in the womb? Um, and like that um, I don't know like the amniotic fluid like just floating yeah that oceanic feeling um, that's yeah that's agape <laughs> as, as we're looking at it in this um, context and so as Freud argues it is not it is not that groups bring out anything new in people it is just that they satisfy the deep-seated erotic longings that people constantly carry around unconsciously. For Freud, this was the life force that held groups together. It functioned as a kind of psychic cement that locked people into mutual and mindless interdependence. The magnetic powers of the leader reciprocated by the guilty delegation of everyone's will to him. So, yeah... Um, well, we, the last couple slides we just looked at this idea of like hypnotization isn't well like <laughs> ugh, I, I hate to mention it but like inception it's very hard to um, actually push new ideas into someone's mind um, basically what you're doing is you're taking advantage of that animal um, that deep rooted instinct of like just being coddled or whatever um, yeah. From his early work, Escape from Freedom, to his recent The Heart of Man, Fromm has developed Freud's views on the need for a magic helper. He has kept alive Freud's basic insight into narcissism as the primary characteristic of man, how it inflates one with the importance of his own life and makes for the devaluation of others' lives how it helps to draw sharp lines between those who are like me or belong to me and those who are outsiders and aliens. Fromm has insisted, too, on the importance of what he calls incestuous symbol, symbiosis, the fear of emerging out of the family and into the world on one's own responsibility and powers. 
the desire to keep oneself tucked into a larger source of power. It is these things that make for the mystique of group, nation, blood, mother, or fatherland, and the like. These feelings are embedded into one's earliest experiences of comfortable merger with the mother. As Fromm put it, they keep one in the prison of the motherly, racial, national, religious fixation. Um, yeah, just more talking about that. Um, yeah. Mm. So this is talking, yeah, the last couple of slides have been talking about why, why people are so easy to be led. And then this slide, we're going to get into how leaders are able to lead their people to do, well, stuff they normally wouldn't do. Yeah. Freud found that the, Freud found that the leader allows us to express forbidden impulses and secret wishes. Reddle saw that in some groups there is indeed what he perfectly calls the infectiousness of the unconflicted person. There are leaders who seduce us because they do not have the conflicts that we have. We admire their equanimity where we feel shame and humiliation. Freud saw that the leader wipes out fear and permits everyone to feel omnipotent. Reddle redefined this somewhat by showing how important the leader often was by the simple fact that it was he who performed the initiatory act when no one else had the daring to do it. Reddle calls this beauty beautifully the magic of the initiatory act. This initiatory act can be anything from swearing to sex or murder. As Reddle points out, according to its logic, only the one who first commits murder is the murderer. All others are followers. Freud has said in Totem and Taboo that acts that are illegal for the individual can be justified if the whole group shares responsibility for them. But they can be justified in another way. The one who initiates the act takes upon himself both the risk and the guilt. The result is truly magic. Each member of the group can repeat the act without guilt. They are not responsible, only the leader is. Reddle calls this aptly priority magic but it does something even more than relieve guilt. It actually transforms the fact of murder. This crucial point initiates us directly into the phenomenology of group transformation of the everyday world. If one murders without guilt and, imita and, and in imitation of the hero who runs the risk, why then it is no longer murder. It is holy aggression. For the first one, it was not. In other words, participation in the group redistills everyday reality and gives it the aura of the sacred, just as in childhood, play created a heightened reality. I really think <laughs> uh, <laughs> as we go through all this, like it's just funny, like looking at our last president and how half the nation was absolutely like wooed and uh um transformed by him and like looking at this um like talk, like the initiatory act of like oh he's a type of guy who um doesn't take shit or um I don't know. Whatever they said about him. Um, I don't know. It's like this... <sighs> like, um... The one I see the most is, um... Like, anti-PC culture... Where it's like, um, oh, our last president wasn't afraid to like make jokes or snide remarks or stuff like that. So it actually, it, it they say it like um, encouraged people to be more whatever. Um, but I think that especially came came to um, like comedy and jokes. Like people take that like on a sacred level. People are like, no, you can't. 
like they sanctify the First Amendment and the freedom of speech and um, like comedy itself is having like no boundaries. Like you can joke about whatever you want if it's comedy. And it's just, it's like it says right here. Um, it redistilled everyday reality and gives it the aura of the sacred. Like it's just, I don't know, it's just really funny to me. Um, but yeah. Reddell showed that groups use leaders for several types of exculpation or relief of conflict, for love or for even just the opposite, targets of aggression and hate that pulls the group together in a common bond. As one recent popular film advertisement put it, they follow him bravely into hell only for the pleasure of killing him and revenging themselves. The instructive thing about his examples is that most of the central person's functions do have to do with guilt, expiation, and unambiguous heroics. The important conclusion for us is that the groups use the leader, sometimes with little regard for him personally, but always with regard uh, to fulfilling their own needs and urges. W.R. Bayan, in an important recent paper, extended this line of thought even further from Freud, arguing that the leader is as much a creature of the group as they of him, and that he loses his individual distinctiveness by being a leader, as they do by being followers. He has no more freedom to be himself than any other member of the group, precisely because he has to be a reflex of their assumptions in order to qualify for leadership in the first place. Yeah. All of which leads us to muse wistfully on how unheroic is the average man, even when he follows heroes. He simply loads them up with his own baggage. He follows them with reservations with a dishonest heart. The noted, the noted psychoanalyst Paul Schilder had already observed that man goes into the hypnotic trance itself with reservation. He said penetratingly that it was this fact that deprived hypnosis of the profound seriousness which distinguishes every truly great passion. Um, and so he called it timid because it lacked the great, free, unconditional surrender. I think this characterization is beautifully apt to describe the timid heroisms of group behavior. There is nothing free or manly about them. Even when one merges his ego with the authoritarian father, the spell is in his own narrow interests. People use their leaders almost as an excuse. When they give in to the leader's commands, they can always reserve the feeling that these commands are alien to them, that they are the leader's responsibility, that the terrible acts they are committing are in his name and not theirs. This, then, is another thing that makes people feel so guiltless, as Kennedy points out. They can imagine themselves as temporary victims of the leader. The more they give in to his spell, and the more terrible the crimes they commit, the more they can feel that the wrongs are not natural to them. It is all so neat, this usage of the leader. It reminds, of a, it reminds us of James Fraser's discovery that in the remote past tribes... Hmm. It reminds us of James Fraser's discovery that in the remote past, tribes often used their kings as scapegoats who, when they no longer served the people's needs, were put to death. These are the many ways in which men can play the hero, all the while that they are avoiding responsibility for their own acts in a cowardly way. The guilt of all the followers does not vanish so easily under the spell of the leader, no matter how much he takes upon himself or how godlike he seems. Not everyone can be equally caught up in identification with him, and not everyone's guilt is so easily overcome. Many people may feel deeply guilty if they violate long-standing and deep-felt moral codes on his behalf. Yet, ironically, it is just this that puts them even more in the leader's power, makes them even more willingly putty, even more willing putty in his hands. If, as we have seen, the group comes ready-made to the leader with the thirst for servitude, he tries to deepen that servitude even further. If they seek to be free of guilt in his cause, he tries to load them up with an extra burden of guilt and fear to draw the mesh of his immortality around them. He gets a, a really coercive hold on the members of the group precisely because they follow his lead in committing outrageous acts. He can then use their guilt against them, binding them closer to himself. 
He uses their anxiety for his purposes, even arousing it as he needs to. And he can use their fear of being found out and revenged by their victims as a kind of blackmail that keeps them docile and obedient for further atrocities. We saw a classic example of this technique on the part of the German leaders <laughs> in the 30s and 40s. <laughs> it was the same psychology that criminal gangs and gangsters have always used to be bound closer together through the crime itself. The Germans called it blood cement or blutkit. I don't know if I said that right, but whatever. Thus, what may begin as the heroic mission of a hit... <laughs> ah... I don't know, because I've already said murder so many times, so I'm pretty sure this video is going to get demonetized anyways. I'll just say it really fast. Thus, what may begin as the heroic mission of a Hitler or a Manson come to be sustained by bullying and threats, by added fear and guilt. The followers find that they have to continue on with the megalomaniac plan because it becomes their only chance of survival in a hostile world. The followers must do what the leader wants, which becomes what they themselves must want in order to survive. If the leader loses, they too perish. They cannot quit, nor does he allow them to. And so the German nation fought on until the final destruction of Berlin. The Manson family held together under persecution and his threats to flee the desert and await the end of the world. This gives an added dimension, too, to our understanding of why people stick with their leaders even in defeat, as the Egyptians did with Nasser. Without him, they may feel just too exposed to reprisal, to total annihilation. Having been baptized in his fire, they can no longer stand alone. Um, yeah, I, I just think that's really interesting. I think I mentioned this in my preface, too, about like um, how hazing and group psychology works. Um, but just this idea, like, if, if some people are, like, on the fence of, like, oh, I don't know if following this leader makes me feel a little guilty um he'll push you to do even more guilty things because um in the end like he's your immortality symbol so if if you separate yourself from that like you, you suddenly have the burden of all your past actions and like you so you're perished you, you're you're perishing under your guilt um, which just, um, instead, most people don't want to do that, so it, it binds them to the leader more, even if they were, like, hesitant to begin with. I just think that, um, dynamic is really interesting. But yeah. From this discussion of transference, we can see one great cause of the large-scale ravages that man makes on the world. He is not just a naturally and lustily destructive animal who lays waste around him because he feels omnipotent and impregnable. Rather, he is a trembling animal who pulls the world down around his shoulders as he clutches for protection and support and tries to affirm in a cowardly way his feeble powers. The powers of the leader stem from what he can do for the people, beyond the magic that he himself possesses. People project their problems onto him, which gives him his role and stature. Leaders need followers as much as they are needed by them. The leader projects onto his followers his own inability to stand alone, his own fear of isolation. We must say that if there were no natural leaders possessing the magic of charisma, men would have to invent them, just as leaders must create followers if there are none available. So it really is like a symbiotic relationship. And both the leader and the follower are, um, this, the, the fear of death, like, um, becomes this, like, feedback loop or, um, not a feedback loop, but, um, it locks them in. Um, in relation to each other. But yeah. Transference is not a matter of unusual cowardice, but rather of the basic problems of power and control. The strength to oppose reality and keep it ordered for our own organismic expansion and fulfillment. What is more natural than choosing a person with whom to establish this dialogue with nature? 
Fromm uses the word idol, which is another way of talking about what is nearest at hand. This is how we understand the function of even the negative or hate transference. It helps us to fix ourselves in the world, to create a target for our own feelings, even though those feelings are destructive. We can establish our basic organismic footing with hate as well as by submission. In fact, hate enlivens us more, enlivens us more, which is why we see more intense hate in the weaker ego states. The only thing is that hate, too, blows the other person up larger than he deserves. As Jung put it, the negative form of transference in the guise of resistance, dislike, or hate endows the other person with great importance from the start. We need a concrete object for our control, and we get one in whatever way we can. In the absence of persons for our dialogue of control, we can even use our own body as a transference object, as Zaz has shown. Oh, wait, let me stop, because um, that's going into something else. Um, so, yeah, this negative transference. Um, well, first off, talking about transference and um, the leader aspects, like looking at the last president, like, yeah, there is that one, like the leader and his followers. Um, and, of course, everyone is so quick to point at that, but you also have the the anti uh president people who were like um who also did the same thing but they were like anti followers um but they were just as um enmeshed in this um system as the followers were um the thing about um negative transference is it's like so instead of um focusing all of the tremendous power on a leader in like a positive way where they're like oh if i if i appease this person then i can achieve immortality um it does the opposite where it's like it focuses all the terror of the world and it's like oh if i can defeat this person then i can overcome um all the negativity in the world um so it's these it's these copes that are like <laughs> um this is what's going on in in the head um as we're looking at this but yeah so yeah we need a concrete object for our control and we get one in whatever way we can in the absence of persons for our dialogue of control, we can even use our own body as a transference object, as Zaz has shown. The pains we feel, the illnesses that are real or imaginary, gives us something to relate to. Keep us from slipping out of the world, from bogging down in the desperation of complete loneliness and emptiness. In a word, illness is an object. We transfer to our own body as if it were a friend on whom we can lean for strength or an enemy who threatens us with danger. At least it makes us feel real and gives us a little purchase on our fate. From all this, we can already draw one important conclusion. That transference is a form of fetishism, a form of narrow control that anchors our own problems. We take our helplessness, our guilt, our conflicts, and we fix them to a spot in the environment. We can create any locus at all for projecting our cares onto the world, even the locus of our own arms and legs. Our own cares are the thing, and if we look at the basic problems of human slavishness, it is always them that we see. As Jung put it in some beautiful words, Unless we prefer to be made fools of by our illusions, we shall, by carefully analyzing every fascination, extract from it a portion of our own personality, like a quintessence, and slowly come to recognize that we meet ourselves time and again in a thousand disguises along the path of life. <sighs> and now we go into part two of the transference cope um where we actually look at more of like the um underlying mechanisms of how all this works um so yeah freud showed how the particular rules for goodness or conscience were built into the child in a given society how he learns the rules for feeling good 
By showing the artificiality of these social rules for feeling good, Freud maps out the dream of the freedom of the Enlightenment to expose artificial moral constraints on the expansive self-feeling of the life force. But the recognition of such social constraints still leaves unexplained the inner urge of the human being to feel good and right. The very thing that odd can't seems to exist independent of any rules, as far as we can tell, as I put it elsewhere. All organisms like to feel good about themselves. They push themselves to ma maximize this feeling. As philosophers have long noted, it is as though the heart of nature is pulsating in its own joyful, joyful self-expansion. When we get to the level of man, of course, this process acquires its greatest interest. It is most intense in man and in him relatively undetermined. He can pulsate and expand both organismically and symbolically. This expansion takes the form of man's tremendous urge for a feeling of total rightness about himself and his worlds. This perhaps clumsy way to talk seems to me to sum up what man is really trying to do and why conscience is his fate. Man is the only organism in nature fated to puzzle what it out to puzzle out what it actually means to feel right. Um, and this this fundamental f um, impulse or um, desire to feel right um, is the same as the um, uh, the fundamental urge towards heroism. Um, which is the, um, which is basically one's, um, ticket to immortality, supposedly. But on top of this special burden, nature has arranged that it is impossible for man to feel right in any straightforward way. Here we have to introduce a paradox that seems to go right to the heart of organismic life and that is especially sharpened in man. The paradox takes the form of two motives or urges that seem to be part of the creature consciousness and that point in two opposite directions. On the one hand, the creature is impelled by a powerful desire to identify with the cosmic process, to merge himself with the rest of nature. On the other hand, he wants to be unique, to stand out as something different and apart. The first motive, to merge and lose oneself in something larger comes from man's horror of isolation, of being thrust back upon his own feeble energies alone. He feels tremblingly small and impotent in the face of transcendent, transcendent nature. If he gives in to this natural feeling of cosmic dependence, the desire to be a part of something bigger, it puts him at peace and oneness, gives him a sense of self-expansion in the larger beyond, and so heightens his being, giving him truly a feeling of it, transcendent value. This is the Christian motive of, of agape, the natural melding of created life in the creation in love which transcends it. As Rank put it, man yearns for a feeling of kinship with the all. He wants to be delivered from his isolation and become part of a greater and higher whole. The person reaches out naturally for a self beyond his own self in order to know who he is at all, in order to feel that he belongs in the universe. Long before Camus penned the words of the epigraph to this chapter, Rank said, For only by living in close union with a God ideal that has been erected outside one's own ego is one able to live at all. And um, Camus' uh, epigraph right here is, uh, Ah, mon cher, for anyone who is alone, without God and without a master, the weight of days is dreadful. Hence, one must choose a master, God being out of style. So yeah, this is um, the agape from this um, perspective. Um, what the psychoanalysts call identification is a natural urge to join in the overwhelming powers that transcend one. Childhood identification is then merely a special case of the urge. The child merges himself with the representatives of the cosmic process. What excuse me, what we have called the transference focalization of terror, majesty, and power. When one merges with, when one merges with the self-transcending parents or social group, he is, in some real sense, trying to live in some larger expansiveness of meaning. We miss the complexity of heroism if we fail to understand this point. We miss its complete grasp of the person, a grasp not only in the support of 
power that self-transcendence gives to him but a grasp of his whole being in love and joy. The urge to immortality is not a simple reflex of the death anxiety, but a reaching out by one's whole being toward life. Perhaps this natural expansion of the creature alone can explain why transference is such a universal passion. Um, yeah. Let's continue. Um, from this point of view, we too understand the idea of God as a logical fulfillment of the agape side of man's nature. Freud seems to have scorned agape as he scorned the religion that uh, preached it. He thought that man's hunger for a God in heaven represented everything that was immature and selfish in man. His helplessness, his fear, his greed for the fullest possible protection and satisfaction. But Rank understood that the idea of God has never been a simple reflex of superstitious and selfish fear as cynics and realists have claimed. Instead, it is an outgrowth of genuine life longing, a reaching out for a plenitude of meaning, as James taught us. It seems that the yielding element in heroic belongingness is inherent in the life force itself, one of the truly sublime mysteries of created life. It seems that the life force reaches naturally even beyond the earth itself, which is one reason why man has always placed God in the heavens. We said it is impossible for man to feel right in any straightforward way, and now we can see why. He can expand his self-feeling not only by agape merger, but also by the other ontological motive, eros, the urge for more life, for exciting experience, for the development of the self-powers, for developing the uniqueness of the individual creature, the impulsion to stick out of nature and shine. Life is, after all, a challenge to the creature, a fascinating opportunity to expand. Psychologically, it is the urge for individuation. How do I realize my distinctive gifts, make my own contribution to the world through my own self-expansion? Now we see what we might call the ontological or creature tragedy that is so peculiar to man. If he gives in to agape, he risks failing to develop himself, his active contribution to the rest of life. If he expands Eros too much, he risks cutting himself off from natural dependency, from duty to a larger creation. He pulls away from the healing power of gratitude and humility that he must naturally feel for having been created, for having been given the opportunity of life experience. Man thus has the absolute tension of the dualism, another dualistic as uh, nature of man. Um, individuation means that the human creature has to oppose itself to the rest of nature. It creates precisely the isolation that one can't stand, and yet needs in order to develop distinctly. Excuse me. It creates the difference that becomes such a burden. It accents the smallness of oneself and the sticking outness at the same time. This is natural guilt. The person experiences this as unworthiness or badness and dumb inner dissatisfaction. And the reason is realistic. Compared to the rest of nature, man is not a very satisfactory creation. He is riddled with fear and powerlessness. Um, now, Becker talks about like natural guilt and all that, but one thing I feel like he um, forgets to mention or whatever... Um, is another aspect of this natural, like, guilt that we have is, like, we almost... Like, I mentioned it before in my last video, how, like, there, there are some people who think that, like, we agreed to come into this existence, so, um... Whatever... This guilt is like knowing like on some deep level like what our 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 what we were before and how far we've fallen um fallen into um this existence, but that's just something that he doesn't actually mention that's something i i wanna mention like that is um something i believe um 
is definitely a factor in this natural guilt. But yeah. The problem becomes how to get rid of badness of natural guilt, which is really a matter of reversing one's position vis-a-vis the universe. It is a matter of achieving size, importance, durability. How to be bigger and better than one really is. The whole basis of the urge to goodness is to be something that has value, that endures. We seem to know it intuitively when we console our children after their nightmares and other frights. We tell them not to worry, that they are good and nothing can hurt them, and so on. Goodness equals safety and special immunity. You might say that the urge to morality is based entirely on the physical situation of the creature. Man is moral because he senses his true situation and what lies in store for him, whereas other animals don't. He uses morality to try to get a place of special belongingness and perpetuation in the universe in two ways. First, he overcomes badness, smallness, unimportance, finitude, by overcoming the rules made by the representatives of natural power, or the transference objects. In this way, his safe belongingness is assured. This, too, is natural. We tell the child when he is good so that he doesn't have to be afraid. Second, he attempts to overcome badness by developing a really valuable heroic gift, becoming extra special. You can see that man wants the impossible. He wants to lose his isolation and keep it at the same time. He can't stand the sense of separateness, and yet he can't allow the complete suffocating of his vitality. He wants to expand by merging with the powerful beyond that that transcends him, yet he wants while merging with it to remain individual and aloof, working out his own private and smaller scale self-expansion. But this feat is impossible because it belies the real tension of the dualism. One obviously can't have a merger in the power of another thing and the development of one's own personal power at the same time. At any rate, not without ambivalence and a degree of self-deception. I disagree, but we'll talk about that later. Um, But one can get around the problem in one way. One can, we might say, control the glaringness of the contradiction. You can try to choose the fitting kind of beyond, the one in which you find it most natural to practice self-criticism and self-idealization. In other words, you try to keep your beyond safe. The fundamental use of transference, of what we could better call transference heroics, is the practice of a safe heroism. In it, we see the reach of the ontological dualism of motives right into the problem of transference and heroism. If transference heroics were safe heroism, we might think it demeaning. Heroism is, by definition, defiance of safety. But the point is that we are making... But the point that we are making is that all the strivings for perfection, the twistings and turnings to please the other, are not necessarily cowardly or unnatural. What makes transference heroics demeaning is that the process is unconscious and reflexive, not fully in one's control. I just want to repeat that. I underlined it. I'm going to repeat it again. What makes transference heroics demeaning is that the process is unconscious and reflexive, not fully in one's control. Let's continue. As we will see in the next chapters, one can nourish and expand his identity of all kinds of gods on heavens as well as hells. How a person solves his natural yearnings for self-expansion and significance determines the quality of his life. Transference heroics gives man precisely what he needs, a certain degree of sharply defined individuality, a definite point of reference for his practice of goodness, and all within a certain secure level of safety and control. We don't know on this planet what the universe wants from us or is prepared to give us. Excuse me. We don't have an answer to the question that troubled Kant or of what our duty is, what we should be doing on Earth. We live in utter darkness about who we are and why we are here, yet we know it must have some meaning. What is more natural, then, than to take this unspeakable mystery and dispel it straight away by addressing our performance of heroics to another human being, knowing thus daily whether this performance is good enough to earn us eternity? 
if it is bad, we know that it is bad by his reactions and so are able instantly to change it. Rank sums up this vital matter in a particularly rich, synthetic paragraph. Here we come upon the age-old problem of good and evil, originally designating eligibility for immortality in its emotional significance of being liked or disliked by the other person. On this plane, personality is shaped and formed according to the vital need to please the other person whom we make our God and not incur his or her displeasure. All the twistings of the self with its artificial striving for perfection and the unavoidable relapses into badness are the results of these attempts to humanize the spiritual need for goodness. I think that's another thing. It's like, um, not only are we striving for immortality, but we also need, <laughs> constantly need validation as well. Uh, fuck, man. Being human is so annoying. Um, but yeah. The meaning of this need for other men to affirm oneself was seen beautifully by the theologian Martin Buber. He called it imagining the real. Seeing in the other person the self-transcending life process that gives to oneself the larger nourishment it needs. In terms of our earlier discussion, we could say that the transference object contains its own natural awesomeness, its own miraculousness, which infects us with the significance of our own lives if we give into it. Paradoxically, then, transference surrendered to the truth of the other, even if only in his physical being, gives us a feeling of heroic self-validation. No wonder that Jung could say that it is impossible to argue away. No wonder, too, for a final time, that transference is a universal passion. It represents a natural attempt to be healed and to be whole through heroic self-expansion in the other. Transference represents the larger reality that one needs, which is why Freud and Ferenczi could already say that transference represents psychotherapy, the self-taught attempts on the patient's part to cure himself. People create the reality they need in order to discover themselves. The implications of these remarks are perhaps not immediately evident, but they are immense for a theory of the transference. If transference represents the natural heroic striving for a beyond that gives self-validation and if people need this validation in order to live, then the psychoanalytic view of transference as simply unreal projection is destroyed. Projection is necessary and desirable for self-fulfillment. Otherwise, man is overwhelmed by his loneliness and separation and negated by the very burden of his own life. As Rank so wisely saw, projection is a necessary unburdening of the individual. Man cannot live closed upon himself and for himself. He must project the meaning of his life outward, the reason for it, even the blame for it. We did not create ourselves, but we are stuck with ourselves. Technically, we say that transference is a distortion of reality. But now we see that this distortion has two dimensions. Distortion due to the fear of life and death, and distortion due to the heroic attempt to assure self-expansion and the intimate connection of one's inner self to surrounding nature. In other words, transference reflects the whole of the human condition and raises the largest philosophical question about that condition. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my stamp of disapproval on this one as well. Um... just because of the um, projection is necessary and desirable for self-fulfillment. Otherwise, man is overwhelmed by his loneliness and separation and negated by the very burden of his own life. I'm going to have to disagree with that. Um, and we'll talk about that more, too. But yeah. Um, Transference reflects the whole of the human condition and raises the largest philosophical question about that condition. How big a piece of reality can man bite off without narrowing it down distortingly? If Rank, Camus, and Buber are right, man cannot stand alone but has to reach out for support. Mm. <laughs> if transference is a natural function of heroism, a necessary projection in order to stand life, death, and oneself, the question becomes... What is creative projection? What is life-enhancing illusion? <laughs> 
People hunger for immortality and get it where they can, in the small family or in the single love object. The transference object is a locus of our conscience, of our whole cosmology of good and evil. It is not something we can simply break away from, as it embodies our whole hero system. We obey our authority figures all our lives, as Freud showed, because of the anxiety of separation. Every time we try to do something other than what they wanted, we awaken the anxiety connected with them and their possible loss. To lose their powers and approval is thus to lose our very lives. Also, we saw that the transference object in itself embodies the mysterium tremendum of existence. It is the primary miracle. In its concrete existence, it transcends mere symbolic commands. And what is more natural than conforming to this miraculousness? We must add with rank, what is more natural than continuing to strive for immortality by fulfilling the moral code represented by the object? Transference is a positive use of the object for, ex for eternal self-perpetuation. This explains the durability of transference and its strength, even after the death of the object. I am immortal by continuing to please this object who now may not be alive but continues to cast a shadow by what it has left behind and may even be working its powers from the invisible spirit worlds. This is a part of the psychology of ancient ancestral worshippers as well as of moderns who continue to live according to family codes of honor and conduct. And...